So, Pat Churchland, UC President's Professor of Philosophy at UC San Diego. Wrote a seminal book in 1986 called Neurophilosophy, and most recently Brainwise, and has write, recently been writing a lot on choice, responsibility, and the basis of moral norms. Uh, yeah, I'm going to try to uh, do this fairly quickly because the afternoon is really moving on. So, so I'll just move along, and um, perhaps then in, later in the discussion uh, we can uh, expand a little bit. But obviously many sciences are going to contribute to the naturalistic uh, task of trying to understand what it is about us that uh, makes us social. Now, every year when I'm at Beyond Belief, I talk about the voles, and this year is no exception. Um, but really, my interest in morality was, was sparked as a result of uh, the discoveries that were made by neuroscientists about the neural mechanisms for attachment. Hitherto, of course, neurobiologists had models that told us something about altruism, but I really wanted to, to sort of wait until we could see uh, what neuroscience might be able to offer. So let me just remind you again that there are various species of voles. Some are largely monogamous, the prairie vole. Some are largely promiscuous. Um, of course, it has to be said that even though the prairie voles are largely monogamous, the males do, as the English say, like to better get a bit of crumpet on the side. And I guess we now know from Sue Carter's work that the females like to get a bit of, shall we say, stud muffin on the side. But they do, they do like to live together. The males nest guard, and they share parenting, and that's very different from the montane voles. Um, now, the, the basic finding, and of course the story is actually very rich, but the basic finding concerns the density of receptors for vasopressin and oxytocin for vasopressin in the nucleus accumbens, uh, sorry, for oxytocin in the nucleus accumbens and for vasopressin uh, in the ventral pallidum. And the behavior changes in a very dramatic way if you block those receptors and all of the various controls are done and that's how we know that that is the crucial part of the story. So then the question has, uh, has arisen, well, do you see uh, anything in the human case that might tell us something uh, about the nature of the role of oxytocin and vasopressin. Now let me just briefly say that we do know quite a lot actually about both of these things and what I'll say here is going to be confined to oxytocin. In animal studies, I'll get to the humans in a moment, but in animal studies one of the things that's really very interesting is that as oxytocin levels go up, then there is a decrease in activity in the amygdala and in the brainstem structures and behaviorally what you see is a decrease in defensive postures such as freezing and fighting and fleeing um, and you see a decrease in autonomic arousal. So oxytocin really functions as a kind of safety signal. So animals when their oxytocin levels go up as they do for example in first mating or as they do with prairie voles when they just kind of hang out together, um, it functions as a safety signal. They feel comfortable, uh, they don't feel threatened. And that feels good by and large. Um, of course, oxytocin is important in uh, delivery. It's also important in lactation. And we know, again, from animal studies that it's very important in uh, parent-offspring bonding. Now, it turns out also there are studies of the effects of the lack of uh, comfort and cuddling as uh, for human infants. And if, if there is a lack of comfort and cuddling when humans are infants, they tend to show poor social, uh, st stable sh social, I'm trying to do this too fast. Uh, <laughs> uh, they don't tend to form good long-term relationships. They have social problems of one kind or another. And in a rather heroic study, it has been found that in fact their oxytocin levels in sort of normal interactions with friendly, f familiar people are lower than they are uh, in controls. Now all sorts of experiments have also been done where what you do is spray oxytocin in the nose and goes up through the olfactory bulb and into the system. And it's known that trust levels increase 
for example, in the investor game. Um, but it's also been shown in human studies using fMRI that you see a comparable decrease in activity in the amygdala and also in the brainstem. And consequently, we, we do see a, a great similarity between uh, what happens in animals and what happens in humans. So like Sam, I'm, I'm sort of inclined to think that there are facts about values, and in particular, I'm inclined to think that the uh, second group of existentialists that Owen talked about, who said that the world itself is meaningless or valueless, and that we have to create value, that they were really quite wrong, that we're all born with these systems that are very deeply into the values business, and that values are much more fundamental uh, than many of the things that moral philosophers uh, tend to talk about. So the basic point is then that social attachment, and I think, as I'm going to s explain, that social attachment really constitutes the biological platform for morality in general. That, uh, what we know is that social attachment is mediated by, amongst other things, oxytocin, vasopressin, the density of receptors, but it's also mediated by dopamine and the endorphins, and there are probably other things uh, that are involved as well. So the fundamental hypothesis that I want to suggest, and I think this might fit with Sam's picture of the moral world, is that attachment and trust are the anchors of morality. That we feel these strong bonds to children, to mates, to kin, and in the case of humans, of course, this can also be expanded beyond the immediate group. And that these strong bonds, and we feel them throughout, um, are tuned up by the reward system so that we are sensitive to particular local practices and conventions. And we come to acquire, at least in the human case, but also I think in some animals, we come to acquire concepts like honest, fair, kind, friend, foe, and so on. Um, like all concepts, these are radial concepts in the sense that they have prototypes that are in the center, and then further out, uh, there are examples that are a little more uh, controversial or hard to classify, and the boundaries are fuzzy. So it's not like there are necessary and sufficient conditions for being honest. Rather, it's that there are certain prototypical kinds of cases that we teach children, we all agree upon, and then there are cases uh, that are further out. So between them, uh, the um, attachment and trust as regulated in the way I describe, and the reward system, I think what you've got is the motivation to do problem solving. And, two for, and, and I guess I really do need to have a place in here for the, for the mirror neurons. It's just that I, I don't really think of the mirror neurons so much as a mirror neuron system as just part of the way the whole shebang works. Uh, but that's a slightly different story. But it seems to me then that, that humans, like other social animals, wolves, bonobos, uh, baboons, we have a powerful motivation to solve complex problems about how to get along. And that much of morality really does, and this is not new, this is just old Aristotle, that much of morality really has to do uh, with problem solving. <clears throat> 